Hi everybody, welcome back to the tenth of an hour with Griffin Bridgers. For today's episode, episode 101, we're going to talk a little bit about estimated tax payments by trust, estates, and beneficiaries. We're going to primarily focus on trusts and estates and look at the rules that apply when they have to pay estimated taxes and maybe what the, the calculation looks like, but not necessarily a specific example of the calculation. We'll take a look at some of the forms that apply as well. Now, as always, this presentation is not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice and is provided for educational purposes only. So, we're not going to really dive into the rules regarding withholding of income tax at the source just because that's a rabbit hole that I don't want to deal with and that I don't think we could deal with in just a tenth of an hour. But for those of you who have been around the tax world enough, uh, or you may have had this affect you individually, you might know that uh, individuals are sometimes required to make estimated tax payments based on their prior year and or current year estimated tax liability. And that's in order to avoid a penalty for underpayment of tax. That especially applies in situations where a lot of your income shifts to being non-wage income, but more things like retirement plan benefits being distributed and you know capital gains and things of that nature that might not be subject to a lot of source withholding or sufficient source withholding. So as I mentioned, I, I brought up individuals, and that's because a lot of the focus on estimated taxes tends to focus on individuals, but a lot of people don't realize that uh, in addition to there being income tax on trusts and estates as independent entities, there's also similar estimated tax requirements that have to be fulfilled in order to avoid penalties for underpayment of taxes by trusts and estates. Now, one benefit, uh, as you may recall from previous discussions on trusts and estates, is that they can take a deduction for distributable net income that passes through to beneficiaries. And in connection with that, trusts and estates can elect to treat a portion of estimated tax as being paid by a beneficiary, maybe correlating to that estimated DNI deduction. But for the time being, the basics of this originate from code section 6654 and in particular section 6654L notes that the estimated tax payments that apply to individuals also apply to certain estates and trusts but there is exceptions. One is an estate generally doesn't have to uh, pay estimated taxes until it reaches the end of a tax year that is past the second anniversary of the decedent's death. So if you're using a fiscal year return with the estate, uh, then most of the time for the first two years of the uh, estate administration, you won't have to file uh, estimated taxes. You may have to in the second year, depending. But Beyond that, if you have a trust that does not owe income tax for the year, which might include a grantor trust, you also wouldn't have to make estimated payments because in that case, the grantor is the one who's taxed on that income and would have to make estimated payments as well. Now, it's often the case that uh, the estate plan involves a revocable trust, might also be a grantor trust, that receives the residue of the decedent's estate or the grantor's estate upon death. And in that case, the revocable trust is like the estate and could even file a consolidated income tax return, making a 645 election. But in the case of that trust, you also have the same estate rules that apply that give a two-year runway, plus or minus, uh, before estimated tax payments have to start. And then finally, a charitable trust, even if it's subject to tax on unrelated business ta uh, income, it wouldn't have to make estimated payments under this regime. Now, the reporting is done with the remittal of estimated tax and a coupon to the IRS using Form 1041-ES for a trust or estate. And the quarterly payments are the same deadlines as exist for individuals. That's April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and then January 15th of the following year after the tax year in question. Now, the trustee or executor could elect to treat part of the estimated tax as being paid by the beneficiary as noted above. And if that's the case, 
the executor or trustee would also remit Form 1041-T, which would carry over that estimated tax to the beneficiary on the beneficiary's K-1 and would also be noted on the Form 1041 on Schedule G. And the beneficiary would be treated in that case as remitting the estimated tax payment with respect to the trust or estate on January 15th of the following year. But then again, the beneficiary must also follow through with their own individual Form 2210 uh, and take that into account as well. Now, where might you use this? Uh, for one, it might be used in the final year of the estate if you're beyond that two-year anniversary and you're making liquidating distributions. It could also be used for any trust uh, um, especially one that might make mandatory income distributions or flat distributions like a unitrust distribution that carries out income or capital gain every year and taxes it to the beneficiary. Now finally, we're not going to dive much into the calculation itself, but uh, some of the general principles are that the trust must expect to owe after withholding cre and credits at least 1000 in tax for the year in question. Now, if that's the case, your estimated payments are going to be 25% per quarter of the lesser of either 90% of the tax that's uh, expected for the current year or 100% of the tax for the prior year. Now. In order to count the tax for the prior year, you have to take into account uh, if there was a prior year return or if the prior year was less than a 12-month taxable year. In either case, there's no tax for the prior year you can use that 100% guideline for. Now, this 100% requirement will increase to 110% if the AGI for the trust for the prior year exceeded 150,000 as determined under code section 67E. And then finally, for farm and fishing income, that 90% requirement would be reduced to two thirds. So if you wanna do this calculation by hand, Great, have at it. There's software that'll do this for you as well, but we're not gonna dive into the specific numbers or examples. As always, if you have questions or topic suggestions, you can email those to me at griffin.bridgers at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of the 10th of an hour, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.